Hi, this is Pat Moorhead, and we're here for another 6.5 on the road, this time at Amazon Remars. I'm here with my incredible host, Daniel Newman. How are you, my friend? Hey, it's good to be here, Pat. Love Amazon Remars. Very cool event. I think if you've watched any of the other ones, you've already heard me, so I'm not going to dive into that too much. But, man, everything from machine learning to space with a little automation and robotics in between. No, I know. The great part is when it all comes together, and Michael, here we are to talk about how this whole Mars things comes together for the industrial uh, IoT. You bet. Good to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so we've got Michael McKenzie with AWS. Uh, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and let you do the quick introduction. I'm going to give you a big question. You ready? I'm ready. The big question is the hardest one. Let's do it. It's probably going to be the easiest one, actually. <laughs> but it's the one that you know everybody's going to want to know. Give us, give us the backdrop. Give us a little bit about yourself, your role, title, when you joined AWS, and what did you do before you landed here? Yeah, right on. Yeah, uh, so I'm Michael McKenzie. I'm the currently the GM for Industrial IoT and Robotics at AWS. Um, I joined AWS about three years ago. Before that, I was a, a VP for a, a large automation and energy management uh, solution provider, uh, building out IoT applications and, and industrial IoT specifically. Um, before that, I was actually a solution architect uh, out in the field, did a lot of years uh, connecting systems. So uh, got great stories uh, from that period of my life. But uh, if you could hang from it in a harness, crawl underneath it uh, to get muddy to commission it, uh, you know, if you needed a, a, a hard hat and high vis jacket and boots, I was probably on the site commissioning and connecting those so, things up. So as my dad used to say, you were doing real work. He always says to me, he goes, you know, he goes, you know, you're on that video. You're not doing real work. That's right. Yeah, That's that, right. that sounds like now you're doing the the, the us work. Now, yeah, now I'm now I'm pampered, and uh, it's a great job. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible uh, how this market is playing out. You know, so I think we're all old enough to remember that it was M to M, right? Yes. Machine that, to machine. Yeah, that was the big thing that was going on. And one of the challenges was that that, that a there were no standards. Right. Uh, there was really uh, I don't know a cornucopia of interfaces and data we really weren't doing much with the data and then we came into this oh we're going to do this iot thing right Right. it's going to solve everything right we're going to have standards uh connectivity uh we've made a lot of progress and we should pat ourselves on the back for about three seconds but (laughs) uh listen you talk with customers every day and they're telling you what their challenges are and uh what are they saying to you what how do we you know what are they, you know, the board is, doesn't have a dictate that says, Hey, I want cloud, right? They're not saying we need some IOT. No, that's right. not how they're saying this, but what are their challenges right now? Yeah. Customers are, are uh, looking for digital transformation and they're looking for business outcomes with this. IOT is one of the architectures that helps to augment that and helps to enable some of that digital transformation. And you're right, we've come a long way from the machine to machine days and and commissioning sites that had, you know, uh, really big ambitions, but almost no way to actually get there uh, to today where it's actually relatively simple to throw on uh, some, you know, peel and stick wireless sensors to augment uh, uh, an architecture uh, or an aging facility or, or anything like that. So we can gather a lot more data. But where customers are going now is, you know, we kind of went through that phase of we drew devices on a whiteboard, we drew an arrow up to the cloud icon that we all drew, and we said, there, IoT is going to solve everything, (laughs) and that'll be our digital transformation. And then we added on things like, you know, hey, let's do analytics and, and machine learning on this, and that's great, and that's really advanced the art to the point where we're saying, okay, now let's use all that insight, let's use that to close the loop back to the process and figure out what we can actually do with it and close that loop with a an algorithm in the middle or a human in the middle, however we want to do it, but to actually make change and, and take action is, is where they're at now. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a, a practicality that everybody wants to know what is being done versus what is being done said. Yes. And that's been a big part of what I've enjoyed about Remars here, whether it's been talking about real things happening in space or the next iteration of conversational AI. And in this case, when it comes to IoT, and you know, we talked to your partners at NVIDIA and we were asking some questions in background about the big challenges. And it seems like the big challenge is that sort of taking it to practical yes. at scale. For years, we've been hearing about the promise of, of industrial IoT, the promise of, you know, industry four, 
you're now, you know, you're not crawling around and in a harness, but you are kind of flying around and seeing customers, at least now that COVID is kind of slowed and you're able yep. to get out there. Yep. Talk about the, the the sort of use cases that you're starting to see, the examples that are gain, being deployed in the field yep. that are maybe representative of some progress between kind of the, the industry four. I was talking about four books ago, you know, I've written <laughs> <Yeah>. seven, <laughs> that I'm still sort of at these events. I'm like, wait, we're still talking about that. Let's, what are we doing that's new, unique, and different that you can, you can share? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, people have, have really figured out what the business outcomes are going to be. And so where we used to talk about industry 4.0 is this, you know, uh, complete game changer, absolute savior and, and the uh, total paradigm shift was going to happen. I think we are seeing progress towards that, but with very specific use cases, people are a little more pragmatic about it now where they're saying, you know, I have energy and sustainability goals. How can I be more effective, more efficient with my energy, with my raw materials coming in? Uh, how do I monitor and, and track progress against that? And how do I close the loop back to the process to make that a reality? Same for, you you know, quality initiatives, same for, you know, uh, some really cool stuff that we're seeing lately, you know, with connected worker and connected robotics. And what's really cool to me is, is some of the, the most interesting cases are changing the way we used to think about factory automation. Right. Um, you know, we used to think about factory automation as being PLCs and drives, you know, uh, controlling motors and belts, and, and that was about it. Now with connected robotics and autonomous ground vehicles and, and uh, robotic arms, things like that, we're really seeing the entire concept of factory automation changing towards having these autonomous vehicles pick parts, carry heavy things from worker to worker rather than the workers having to go get them or, or transport them between each other or relying on these other uh, uh, types of processes. So it's changing the way we think about factory automation. It's thinking about, you know, it's changing the way we think about asset management in general uh, across every sector. Yeah, and I, for, I'm going to editorialize a little bit here. Sure. You know, having grown up in, in all these different stages here and then i look at kind of the history of it and what really got them moving the 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 plus is that we're at least talking about reducing expenses increasing revenue right i mean that's why businesses exist and right you know we can talk about you know customer retention but it all gets back to revenue or lowering expenses and um one of the one of the reasons that it's a little bit slower i think is because particularly when it it comes to brownfield environments like a warehouse or like a factory these are these are businesses that might have been in business for a hundred years right uh, there might have been a boiler that is, has been around for 50 years that you know we found a way to get analog data out of it but you know now we can put one of your modules on it yep. and you know pre-predict not I don't need a monthly checkup I'm going to check on it when those parameters hit a certain level that I actually have to go out there. And that's a cost saver, right? Absolutely. And if you take that to the next step, you can even make your products better by uh, and, and potentially even changing business models to where you're not selling. There's a company that I know that used to sell oxygen bottles and now they sell oxygen as a service. Sure. They've instrumented this so much that, that they can make uh, more money, get bigger commitment uh, to their customers and their customers love it. So uh, in a way, this is about CX and about getting back to that digital transformation piece. Um, so we're here at, at, at Mars, right? Which, you know, it's a lot, right? But I'm, I'm getting this sense and particularly in the run up and everything I've seen that, that you're able to leverage every one of these, maybe except for space. I don't know, maybe you can do that. But how are you leveraging all of these different areas to so the sum of the parts is bigger than them standalone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I'd go back to to what you were editorializing is is uh, it's reducing costs, it's uh, increasing revenue, but it's also improving worker health and safety, uh, which is a big driver for some of the companies that we're working with. And you know, when you look at things, you know, the way the the machines have evolved and the way that this technology has evolved, we don't necessarily have crews going machine to machine or even right. analyzing dashboards for predictive maintenance anymore. We have machines reaching out, SMSing somebody saying, "I think I know my own problem. Here's what it is. You should come fix me and." Bring this type of part, right? So we've actually gone even further. And why have we done that? 
You mentioned space. We actually learn a lot from being in space uh, because we learn about truly disconnected edge scenarios. Yeah. Um, those then can be applied to things like ships at sea here here on Earth. Uh, we can apply them to you know critical manufacturing that can't be without a connection or without that inference engine running in the edge uh, for for more than you know five to fifteen minutes. Uh, so we actually start to learn a lot from being in space, and we learn a lot from the the advances that we have. Have with machine learning and AI that we can then apply to, you know, uh, grouping concepts like digital twin. And this is where it starts to get really exciting because we have all of this promise of IoT data that we can gather from the, from all the different sensors that we have and equipments. We have robotics out there that we can control. And when we bridge all this together into something like a digital twin where we're also adding simulations and and what if scenarios and figuring out you know what are all the possible or probable outcomes from me making a small tweak here i can immediately see results and understand am i optimizing or am i hurting myself right, right. and that some of the whole coming together is really what becomes powerful about all this technology and the definition right of uh, synergy the whole is greater than the sum of its parts yeah i just want to throw that out there because i remembered it and i felt super quick <laughs> um so michael these events tend to come with some announcements sure um we you know we're not a show that uh, people just get to you know beat their chest but we do like to give you a platform and we can talk a little bit about it so what's the news you know <laughs> spill yeah we've uh, in the last uh day we launched a new product called iot express link um we i think we announced that at reinvent as a preview it's now in ga and it actually just won a best in show award for embedded uh design at uh, embedded world this week so that's pretty cool and for everyone out there that doesn't know what iot express link is yeah it's a it's a a module that we're working with partners and, and a series of libraries to enable embedded developers to uh, treat cloud development the same way they would treat any embedded development. So they can listen for IOs on pins and they can put IOs on pins. We handle all the networking, all the complexity of identity management, everything else behind the scenes to make them into cloud developers without a lot of effort. Uh, so that's a pretty cool one. Uh, we've also just launched Digital Twin in GA. That was uh, just a month ago. We've seen a lot of really cool stuff coming out of our customers already. Um, so many interesting how things. Yeah, interested people are in Digital Twin. It is. You know, sometimes it's it's part of our job to separate the wheat from the chaff, and and the Digital Twin part seemed like I don't want to say it was obvious, but the ability to uh, manage and visualize things in the physical world. Uh, in the virtual world, um, it's incredible. And, yeah. and it's really one of the first true VR and AR uh, use cases that actually has some legs. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd actually uh, double down on that and say it's the maybe most pragmatic metaverse <laughs> application when right. you think about yes. like it is going to be the industrial applications. Uh, you know, we mentioned NVIDIA, but the Omniverse, like the whole idea of autonomous, simula simulated, yep. replicated, uh, synthetic data, like this coming together to say, hey, we can develop faster, we can be, make safety happen faster, we yep. can test faster, um, and we can do it all basically in while we sleep. Now, again, yep. there's some work that has to be done. You know, if you talk to the data scientists, they're gonna be like, hey, don't, don't make it sound like you can, uh, you know, you can automate my job. But at the same time, like, as we make that synthetic data more and more in, invaluable, eventually it's like, we build the building before we ever break ground. Right. And yeah, we so know I'm, how it's going to work. So I'm sorry. I, I interrupted. I got no, all, not at all. all I got excited on GA of digital. <laughs> Wait, are there more? It, is there more, out, are no, there more uh, announcements? No, no not that no, I can no, think no. of. Okay. You did okay. <laughs> no, digital twin is exciting. I mean, you, you talk about the metaverse. Now take uh, the combination of digital twin uh, that is live and operational. Um, combined with some synthetic data, things like that, but also combined then with autonomous robots out there, we could today start to combine these technologies into, uh, you know, reducing human harm when we have to send them into difficult situations, like uh, let's say a nuclear disaster or something like that. We could have autonomous vehicles, we could have, uh, you know, uh, robotics out there doing things while we're collecting live data from the site and using Digital Twin to control it all. We can do that today. That's that's extremely exciting for me. And, and what's interesting too is this the social aspect of the digital twin that that it's funny everything is easy 
uh, once you've figured it out and you're just thinking, oh, of course, everybody knew this. But there's also, I found some solace in people being, having a human in the middle. Mm. Okay. Let's say the robot is doing something that it's not supposed to be doing. And if, if you weren't connected as a digital twin and couldn't see what it was doing, you, you couldn't do that. So, and I think we'll never really, I mean, never say never, but there is, there's no perfection. I mean, heck, we saw Hal in 2001, right? There, you know, <laughs> there was no human in the middle to, uh, to do something with that. So I think that is another reason why I think people are really into this because a lot of these, the brownfield companies, they're not as comfortable. Um, they did start, they weren't born in the cloud. In fact, uh, odds are they were born uh, when electronics were vacuum tubes or, mm. or punch cards. When you right. were like 20? <laughs> exactly. Uh, g- that's a good one. That's Thanks. a good one. Uh, I, have hair, I have the hair, though. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but Comparatively. No. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, it's one of these things that, 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 that just fascinates yeah, me uh, sure. about this here. So final question here. I have sure. to ask you kind of what's in, how do we accelerate this? How do we accelerate your, uh, not, not your business, but, but the market in general of the industrial IoT. We're doing so many good things. So we're back to where we started. Hey, let's pat ourselves on the back from M to M. Here we are, IoT. We tried to go horizontal again. That didn't work. A, a great. We tried to go, and we went vertical, and we're like, well, that's what we did in M to M, right? <laughs> so how do we get this going uh, even faster? You know, I, I think we have to go back to the concepts that work and you mentioned uh you know some of the the longer standing companies and, and some of the technologies they've tried over the years i think the reason things like digital twin resonates so well is they've been using 3d images and SCADA systems for so long so digital twin isn't that much of a leap and you know when you have something like that coming through that feels familiar but is also so much more powerful for remote access it starts to uh, shade that boundary of do I care if it's in the cloud or on-premise? Uh, I don't because I have remote access, I have a familiar interface, and I can uh, do the same things I've always wanted to do, but now I can do them from my kid's baseball game. Um, I think I think the way we make this all accelerate is by making it simpler, by making sure that uh, anybody can build a twin, anybody can build, uh, you know, uh, put a, a sensor on a, a, a piece of equipment uh, and start gathering that data without a lot of effort. The more uh, simple we can make this, the faster we get results. The faster we get results, the faster we accelerate these uh, these businesses. Yeah, I'd love to see a lot more um, case studies out there. Yep. And I think sometimes, I mean, listen, I've done, I have had a lot of different jobs, product management, product marketing, corporate strategy, but, you know, when it comes down to um, case studies, it doesn't have to don't even have to cite the name of the company. I think what people want to know is, hey, a top 10 um, manufacturer had this problem. They yep. needed to reduce their cost or increase their revenue. It's totally blind and nobody knows about it. That's how we're going to get people uh, on this. That's that's where we get the board of directors talking about this and the ELTs yep. really, because sometimes there's, you know, they're so focused on things like supply chain and they're trying to run a business that all this extra stuff it's 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 not computing they don't know they can even do this stuff even though we all do and we live in this but we're kind of not normal right um you know they largely want to be able to read off the problem and say all right just put all this stuff together and make it better mm -hmm. right most boards don't invest in tech and you know we don't buy technology to solve tech problems we buy technology to solve business problems and so i think what you're really trying to say here to to michael which you know we need to let him go is put all this tech together and let's start telling that story of outcomes so that the world can hear that this next generation of IOT isn't still this kind of fairy tale. It shouldn't be like space. This is a lot more practical. And by the way, a lot of what we're hearing about space is getting really practical. So, yeah. you know, Michael, we would love to keep chatting, maybe have you come back. Let's talk about this again next year at Remars once Great. again. Um, thank you so much for joining us here thank you. for this 6.5 on the road at Amazon Remars. A lot of fun. You smile a lot, and I like that. And by the way, it's good for camera. <laughs> stay happy. Stay smiley. Right on. Keep connecting the world. We appreciate you, and we'll have you back soon. Thank you both. Thanks, everybody.